just want to welcome everybody. Uh, most of y'all, this is more for the people that uh, might not be in my class. I'm Professor Carolina Caballero in the Department, a joint uh, Department of Spanish and Portuguese and Latin American Studies, and this is an intro to Latin X culture class. Um, and um, so the idea for this came from the fact that, um, so I'm teaching an introduction to Latinx culture and I'm covering the entire United States and I'm like, how do I tackle what is going on in New Orleans? Because I also think that's important for the students to know what's going on around them. So uh, my idea was to have a, a kind of an informal lecture series um, and have local members of the Latinx community talk about the Latinx community. So um, we have several uh, already scheduled, uh, but our first one is today with uh, Rafael Delgadillo, which I'm super excited about. He's here to tell us a little bit about the history of the Latinx community um, and uh, a little bit about being a part of this community since he was, uh, well, Rafael, you weren't born in New Orleans, but you were raised here? Exactly. Right. Um, so, um, I'm going to let, and this is going to be very informal, Rafa is going to talk uh, for about half an hour, maybe show some images, and then uh, the floor is open for any questions. You can either uh, write in your questions on the chat, or uh, all y'all know how to raise your hand. Um, I think, yes, if not, and then you could, uh, well, the floor will be open for, uh, for questions cool. afterwards. Okay, so I'm going to let, um, I'll let Rafa kind of introduce himself. Uh, he's currently a PhD candidate in the Department of Latinx Studies and Latin American Studies. Latin American and Latino Studies is the Sorry, Latin American and Latino Studies um, in UC Santa Cruz. Uh-huh. Right. Uh, great combination. And just a little bit, I have known Rafa since I moved to New Orleans, not that long, only like 10 years. Um, but I have to, Rafa was kind of a, a staple in when I started teaching Latino studies, right, in Spanish and Portuguese. Look, Rafa, I would bring Rafa in to talk about um, uh, being Latino, and he worked for a local uh, nonprofit that worked with the Latino community, talk about that. But because of Rafa was the first time I ever started thinking about whiteness and mm -hmm. whites and, and critical whiteness studies um, and thinking of white as a race, and of course, why not? But um, and of course, Rafa has been, uh, he's made me think about a lot of other things, but that's one thing that's been uh, very important. And I always think fondly of uh, the things I've learned from him. So please, without, uh, I'm not gonna hesitate or stop, let Rafa go ahead. Rafa, please. Hey, thank you, Dr. Caballero. And uh, I just gotta thank you once again for inviting me. It's been about seven years since uh, I visited one of your classes, but uh, I, I, it's been that long, but I've also lost count of how many times you've invited me over. So. You know, back when I was still living in town, um, it was definitely a staple of, of my life, too. Um, and so, yeah, so I guess what I'll do is I'll just, like I said, this is going to be a little informal. I'll try to take up 20 to 30 minutes if I can. And I'm just going to do a sort of a, a personal bio so that I think that's a way for y'all to get a feel uh, for how I've experienced life in New Orleans as, as a person from the Latin American migrant community, right? Um, and after that, then I'm going to get into uh, some research. Um, bit of a, my bio as a researcher, my research, my research interests, because they have um, continued on really since I got my master's uh, over 10 years ago. So um, just to, you know, just to uh, let you guys know who I am, get a little bit uh, better feel for, for me. So my parents are from the Dominican Republic, and uh, they met in New York in the 1970s, really much, um, that was the height of the Dominican uh, exodus from the Dominican Republic into New York. That's when the, the community really began establish, uh, becoming established up there in Washington Heights. Um, that's where I was born in New York. When I was about six months old, we left New York. So I can't say that I claim New York as a home. Uh, got a lot of relatives there. It's a nice place to visit, um, but I wouldn't claim it as a, as a home. Uh, when I was six months old, we moved to the Dominican Republic. And I have a lot of uh, memories from uh, for my years there. We lived there till I was six, but you know, it's one of those things um, from living there, uh, being such so young and, you know, being around all my relatives and having relatives all over the island, I, I've got some pretty, uh, some pretty good memories, some pretty fond memories of, of that place. Um, and then we ended up in New Orleans, 1988. And so even though I was born in the United States because I left so early and because I, I came back uh, at the age of six, I had to learn English 
you know, I can't say that I'm an immigrant, but I do feel like I do have an immigrant's experience, right? Um, we were in, me and my family were in a new place. I had to learn a new language, uh, going to a school, new culture, just uh, everything was pretty, um, was pretty new for me. Um, to give you context, uh, the Dominican community in the New Orleans area is pretty small. I don't have the numbers, but um, Dr. Caballero provided you with, um, with uh, an article with the data. So I'm not gonna you know, um, go over that too much, but I'll say that when I moved to, to, the, to New Orleans in 1988 at the age of six, uh, in my estimate, there couldn't have been more than a few thousand Dominicans in the New Orleans area. I could be wrong, but um, it couldn't have been more than that, and it felt like we all knew each other. Um, the vast majority of Dominicans in, in the New Orleans area live on the West Bank. So even though when we moved to New Orleans, um, uh, we lived uptown, we lived in the Central City, then we moved to Gentilly for a couple years. And once we figured out that the vast majority of Dominicans lived on the West Bank, uh, and that rent was actually a little bit cheaper uh, on that side of the river, that's where we decided to, to move. And so I, uh, you know, as a New Orleanian, inside, you know, outside of, of New Orleans, I'm a New Orleanian. Inside of New Orleans, I consider myself a West Banker. Uh, even though um, I've got, you know, I've lived pretty much all over the metro area, but that's where I went, uh, that's where my four years were, and that's where I went to high school. I went to John Eric down there in Marrero. Um, and that's not a school that has many Dominicans either, which is really interesting. I would say that the vast majority of Dominican students, of Dominicans, go to West Jefferson High School. Um, at least back when I was going, uh, when I was in high school, uh, a lot of my friends, even some cousins, that's where they ended up going to school. Uh, uh, whereas pretty much everywhere else, you didn't really have too many Dominicans um, in the, in the high school. Um, and so yeah, so that um, so yeah, so I guess at that point I can say that uh, you know once I got through high school, I guess I should reflect on the fact that it. By that point in life, it, I realized that, um, and I think my dad did a really good job of getting me prepared to understand that I was a black person in New Orleans as well. Um, that's something that, uh, you know, I, I honestly, you know, when I think about it, I don't know uh, my sister, I have two sisters and uh, we're all, the three of us are different skin tones. Um, I'm the darkest one. I also have the nappiest hair. Right. Um, and so I think my dad did an intentional job of preparing me to be a black person in the South, even though he didn't have much of a clue about what that meant. Um, because he hadn't grown up in the South. I think he, he understood that, you know, after after a few years after seeing that uh, David Duke almost got elected governor three years after we moved there, after, uh, you know, seeing the battles over, you know, th these uh, sorry if I'm going all over the place, Dr. Caballero, but, um, you know, uh, these monuments that got taken down, these Confederate monuments. Those fights were going on when I moved to New Orleans in 1988. The, the monuments about a Liberty Place had just been moved uh, from one place to another because that fight had been so old. Um, uh, right, so I think uh, I want to mention that, that um, my dad won, you know, I did it by that time, by the time I was in high school, I realized that it meant something to be a black person in New Orleans. But then with, because of things that I'll get to a little bit later, I also realized that being black in New Orleans also meant something a little bit different than in the rest of the country, just because of the particular colonial history that's in, that's in this city and the impact that the, that the discourse of race has had on the, on the rest of the United States, right? Um, uh, from that point on, I guess I'll, I'll say that after high school, I went, to, I, I, I went to the University of New Orleans. I got both my bachelor's and my master's in history there. Um, I'll get into that later because my, my history research directly ties into, into uh, Spanish speaking communities in New Orleans and it ties into the current research that I'm doing now. Um, so the thing is when I got out of, my, out of, uh, out of the master's program in 2009, uh, we, I'll say that uh, I had already um, started working for a nonprofit organization called Puentes New Orleans, right? I started volunteering in 2008 then they bumped me up to a part-time, uh, to have a part-time job. And by the time I got my master's, they hired me on full-time as a community organizer uh, slash outreach coordinator. Um, so that, I did that for five years and <laughs> there's a lot that I could say about that time, uh, but I, I, I can't say everything. Um, I'll say that, uh, you know, uh, after, after Katrina, the city had, um, there were a lot of things going on, but one of the 
positive things. One of the things that for someone at my age that, that I felt um, really strongly and passionate about is that there was really this, uh, this revival of, um, of uh, small D democracy in the city of grassroots organizing of people really, uh, you know, coming together and, and trying to figure out how to, you know, how to solve the problems that we were having post Katrina. Um, that's really why uh, Puentes was, um, was one of, uh, you know, really uh, gained traction after that and was founded. Jimmy Hunt was actually one of the first board members that we had back in those days. Um, and it was a, a young organization back then. The, the one positive thing is that because of it was post Katrina, there was a lot of philanthropy, a lot of money from philanthropists coming in. And so Puentes was well funded. But, you know, and we did a lot of good work. We did leadership development. We did outreach to Latino communities uh, all over the, you know, public safety issues. Uh, particularly, one of my jobs was to uh, um, do public safety outreach to day laborers at the various day labor um, uh, pickup sites, which I don't know if there are any left. If there are, I would imagine there's fewer than, than there were 10 years ago. Um, but that was, that's how I got my start in that, in that job. Um, then, you know, went on to you know, we try to do some community organizing, but that's um that's a very hard thing to do in New Orleans, particularly with um with the with the Latino community, because as as I'm, I'm imagine all of you know or or have experienced, it's not a monolithic community, right? It's made up of 21 different countries, with very different migration patterns, with very different histories, very different um uh, uh, stories of migration, right? And uh, and so it, it it's not like uh, you can just throw folks from all these different places into one space and it automatically becomes a community. But I can say that in certain occasions throughout my life, I have seen that happen, right? Um, and you did see uh, a need for that after Katrina. Um, so yeah, so we did, so Buentes is actually still around. Um, uh, Salvador uh, Longoria is, um, is, uh, is the executive director there. He was one of the founders. Um, I think they're more focused on, on youth development programs now than, than they were uh, when I was there. Back then we had multiple programs, um, a pretty large staff for a nonprofit. Well, not large, but just si sizable. Um, and now I think they're just down to just a couple of programs that really just focus on youth, which I think is the, actually the best way to go, is to really just be really be focused on one or two missions instead of uh, being spread around. And, and you know, you have to, um, you know, one thing I learned, uh, and I learned a lot of things, is that you have to pick your battles. Um, you're not going to win every issue. And so it's really, for me, you know, if I had to do it all over again, I'd make sure that I'd just be focused on one or two things instead of, uh, instead of trying to, you know, uh, multitask. That's not something I believe in anymore. Um, so yeah, we did youth work, leadership development. Um, uh, Dr. Caballero, is there anything you're thinking of right now or something you want to interject with? I know that you were around back then, so you took on a lot. You volunteered with us no. a lot observed a lot back then so I don't know no 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 not all you keep going you keep going okay. I think the the students may might should know that that Buentes was born out of post Katrina because of the population the Latinx population kind of or Latino population kind of skyrocketed with an influx of workers right, right post Katrina so right. that was so Buentes was kind of born of that I bet I mean Jimmy can talk a little bit more about uh Buentes and where that came from as well but I'm not sure they might not be aware of that. Right, right. and I, I guess I'll also point out that uh, if you ask me as someone from the community, uh, someone who's pretty aware of the history of, 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 you know, the patterns of migration into New Orleans from Latin America, I would say that there's two big uh, dates that are really important uh, when we talk about uh, the Latino uh, community and its emergence in the New Orleans metropolitan area, and that's 1965, after the passage of the, uh, of the Immigration and Nationalization Act of 1965, that lifted the quotas for uh, immigrants coming in from, from Latin America, and also 2005, just for the same reasons that Dr. Caballero just laid out, uh, because of, of the influx of day laborers, um, of workers that came in, not just day laborers, but construction workers, many of them day laborers. We should add that, um, I need to add that President Bush at the time lifted uh, an executive order prohibiting, uh, prohibiting employers from um, from hiring um, people that were undocumented, right? So after Katrina, uh, contractors could hire undocumented people with no questions asked. Uh, George W. Bush then proceeded to influx the city with about 300 agents from, from ICE, right? So there was a huge hypocrisy. Um, there was a lot of anger and, you know, just mistrust that continues to this day um, with ICE, as we can, as we can see. Um, so, so, yeah, so I think at this point is where you know, I'll, and obviously, if y'all have any questions for me about the personal stuff that I've been sharing, I welcome that. But I'm gonna 
flip over to, um, to my research interests, right? Um, because this is where they kind of start correlating. As I said, uh, I got my master's, uh, you know, right about the time that I started working full time at Fuentes. And so there, there's a correlation there in my life. Um, but, you know, I want to start off, I guess, with a prologue about why I have these interests, right? And, and the prologue, it's two stories that about my father. And my father died two years ago. So obviously, you know, for any of us that have experienced that, we know that there's a reflection process we go to. And, and I can really thank my father for, for a lot of things. One, for helping me understand that I was a black person in the deep South when, you know, as a Latino man, I may not have, you know, understood that um, as, 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 uh, as readily as I could have if it wasn't for him. But also his, his, uh, his own curiosity, you know, it might be the reason why I'm getting the PhD is because he couldn't. Um, but one thing that he said, uh, the first thing that he said, I was about 12 years old and my father used to work downtown on Canal Street right on the edge of the French Quarter. And the parking garage that he used to park his car was on Royal Street, about two or three blocks in, uh, into the quarter. And he spent a lot of time in the quarters. You know, was, I, I ended up working in the French Quarter later at hotels. So, you know, if you work there, you, went, you end up getting to know that place. And, and he would say, you know, that he often found himself walking through the French Quarter and just feeling like he was back in the Dominican Republic, right? And that always stood out to me. And when he said it at the time, I didn't understand understand it but of course my dad said it so it had to be true and I think that that sparked a curiosity in me and I go into into that a little later but the th second thing that he says that's not directly tied to New Orleans but I'm going to make the connection in a second is I remember when I was about 16 years old uh, my dad would have Saturdays off around that time and what does uh, you know I, my dad even though he's Dominican he, he came up as a teenager and in his 20s in, in New York in the 70s and even though he's Dominican his first love is salsa Right? He's not a merenguero, he's not a bachatero, my dad is, was a salsero. And Hector Laveau was, you know, uh, was his favorite, you know, uh, I heard Hector Laveau growing up all my life. And on Saturdays, you could often find my dad, like a lot of Latino men actually, viewing old VHS tapes of, of these variety shows and these performances from the 70s, right? <laughs> Dr. Caballero shaking her head because she knows exactly what I'm talking about. And I remember sitting there one day, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm a child of hip hop. My first love is hip hop, but I always appreciated my dad's love for salsa and that the music was always in the background. But I remember him saying something specifically on one Saturday when I was 16 and it was just off the cuff. He wasn't, he was talking to me, but he didn't even think about saying, he just said, well, you know, the drum beats in salsa are, are African. They come from, from, our, from the roots of our enslaved ancestors. And I just remember just turning around like, what? You know, this moment where, you know, I knew why I spoke Spanish, I knew why I was Catholic, you know, these things about colonialism that, you know, are just inherent. But to be 16 and to find out that the music all around me had actually survived the transatlantic um, voyage, that was a really huge moment for me. And I really appreciated that my father just threw that out there, right? And and the reason why that's connected to New Orleans is because when I really started developing my passion for history and really started uh, doing my research in, into the history of the city, you know, particularly being, um, being sparked by its French and, 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 uh, and Spanish foundations, you know, that explained why my father felt like he was walking through the Dominican Republic because the architecture of neighborhoods like the French Quarter and Treme and the Marigny and the Bywater are, are, are Creole African influenced Caribbean architecture. It doesn't look exactly like it does in the Dominican Republic, but it does look a lot like it. And not only in the Dominican Republic, you go to Haiti, you go to Cuba, you go to port cities in Mexico and Brazil, you're gonna find very similar architecture, right? Um, but it's not just the architecture, it's also the food, right? It's the stew, it's the fact that New Orleans has a lot of stew heavy cuisine like, like uh, gumbo and things like that. But when you go to the Caribbean or, or to Latin America, you're gonna find things uh, like, uh, like uh, I'm forgetting the name of the Cuban dish, but uh, in the Dominican Republic, we call it asopao. Uh, and, uh, and there's also uh, these other dishes that just basically, it's, it's, the, uh, it's the outcome of enslaved people just throwing stuff into a pot and stewing it, right, with rice. Um, uh, uh, it's also the music, right? Um, uh, not, it's also, uh, you know, uh, the way in which, uh, you know, uh, that uh, the Spanish and the French interpreted race and how they and how their urban slavery was different from from urban slavery in Britain, in the British colonies, right, where uh, a, a person of color 
could actually buy their own freedom because they could earn money even though they were they were property. That's a that's a um, uh, institution called Cuartación. Again, sorry if I'm going all over the place, but again, I'm finding these things in New Orleans history that could only be that weren't found anywhere else in the United States, but they were found in Latin America. And then um, and then again, as I kept doing my research into New Orleans, I found out about Congo Square. And Congo Square, for those of you that don't know, is, is a place that's uh, in, in the Treme neighborhood, right behind the French Quarter. It's literally on, across from the French Quarter on Rampart, what they used to call back of town, because this is where enslaved people were allowed to, to uh, on Sundays after church, to go to market, to form a market where they could trade with themselves, where black people had their own economy on Sundays in New Orleans. This is also known, it's been well recorded throughout history by travelers and visitors that uh, African, enslaved Africans would dance. They would perform these, these ritualistic and religious uh, dances, um, you know, um, that had their roots uh, in Africa, uh, but uh, were also in partly formed by, by their collective experience in New Orleans. And, you know, I started finding out that those kind of spaces were not likely to exist in a place like Charleston or Baltimore, but they were, but there were Congo squares or places like Congo squares in Bahia or Santo Domingo or Havana or Tampico in Mexico, right? And so I realized that, you know, until the Louisiana Purchase, there's this, there's, we can think of, Louisiana, of, of New Orleans as being on the periphery of Latin America, right? I wouldn't call it a Latin American city because Latin America didn't exist as a concept yet, right? But Louisiana Creole identity does pre, does, uh, does uh, predate, does precede the concept of Latin America. And so I think there's a discussion to be had about the colonial heritage of Louisiana, the, particularly the colonial heritage of New Orleans, and put that into conversation with the colonial development of Latin America, right? Um, um, so, so, yeah, so that, that's, that's uh, that, 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 I'm trying to explain the, the prologue that I use. This is why I was so interested in a, uh, in, in, the, in these connections, what, you know, my father's, um, you know, reflections leading me to, to have this uh, understanding of New Orleans, right? And it really led me to appreciate it, right? It really, um, because again, carnival, you know, anybody that's from Latin America, especially in the Caribbean and in Brazil, carnival is a very huge part. It comes from the Catholic tradition, but it's infused with African influence, with African culture, as it is, as Mardi Gras is, as, uh, as carnival in the Dominican Republic and in Brazil is. Um, the fact that, uh, that, you know, the Catholic Church baptized enslaved Africans, that's not something that Protestant churches did in the British colonies, right? This is a way of creating mestizaje, a, a, a cultural hybridity that led to racial mixture. So even though we have these concepts of race and white supremacy in New Orleans, we still have, you know, you go in New Orleans history and you find terms like octoroon and quadroon to describe people's degrees of blackness. And then when the Americans come in, they say, well, no, it's you're either black or white, we're going to put the one drop rule. And that's why you have the Plessy versus Ferguson case in, coming from New Orleans, because the one drop rule that, that satisfied the rest of the United States just didn't fly in New Orleans because the ideas of race were much more like the ideas of race and of caste that we find in Latin America. Um, so then uh, I get out of that, uh, and that's really something I'm in conversation with now. I got my master's um, in history at the University of New Orleans in 2009. And I want to go back to that because that relates because um, I decided to study, my, my master's thesis was on the history of Spanish language newspapers uh, in New Orleans, right? And one thing that, that uh, I didn't know until 2008, uh, which was really, um, you know, serendipitous because it, it was during um, uh, the celebration of a bicentennial. Uh, what was this bicentennial? In 1808, the first Spanish language newspaper ever published in the United States was published in New Orleans. It was, uh, it was actually a newspaper entitled El Mississippi. And let me see if I can figure out this, uh, this uh, I think I have this here, Dr. Caballero. Let me see if I can figure out how to, how to share it with everyone. Uh, right, okay, here we go. Okay, I can't figure it out. I haven't done this before, but you know what I can do is I can send you, I can, I can email it to you and your students can see it uh, because I don't want to spend my time perhaps doing something embarrassing <laughs> trying to find this, uh, this document and showing it on the screen. But uh, if you Google El Mississippi, New Orleans, 1808, you will see a picture of what I'm trying to send you of the first Spanish language newspaper in the United States. Um, 
And uh, El Mississippi only lasted for a couple of years as most Spanish language newspapers and publications in the New Orleans area, that's their history, is that they don't last for more than a couple of years. And it really just, um, it was there to help the Spanish population of New Orleans, the ones who had been left over after the Louisiana Purchase, to stay abreast of news going on in Spain and in, in, in Spain's possessions of what became Latin America, right? Um, uh, I would later, um, while doing research on this, I found a newspaper that was published in New Orleans in 1888 called El Moro de Paz. And El Moro de Paz lasted again for about two to three years from 1888 to 1890. And, um, and El Moro de Paz was a much more complete newspaper than in Mississippi. Uh, it was a weekly newspaper. It had news on, on mostly, was mostly interested in, in uh, the development of, co of commercial relationships between New Orleans and Latin America, particularly Cuba and, uh, and, um, and, and Mexico and, and, uh, and, and some parts of South America. Um, uh, the editor of the, of the newspaper was a Spaniard who was actually at the time pretty prominent and well-known throughout the city. His name was Jose Antonio Fernandez de Traba, if you want to say that three times fast. Um, and, uh, and he was actually, he, from what I've read, and, and I, I'd, I'd actually like to get back home and do more research on this, apparently he was the first chair of the Spanish department at Tulane. Um, yeah, this would have been in the 1880s, but uh, I, I couldn't find... I, I saw that written somewhere, but not in any Tulane records. So I'd, I'd love to go to Tulane and do more research there. Um, uh, interestingly enough, whereas uh, when you look at El Mississippi in 1808 and in and, uh, and, and Moro de Paz, there's a thread that, that actually tells us how the United States changed over time, right? Uh, through how the 19th century was really a, 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 an American century that, that where, where the United States changed in 1808, uh, the vast majority of Latin America is still co colonized and under Spanish hands. And it's, it's pretty clear that a Mississippi is a conduit of these relations of, of this young United States, you know, uh, establishing and solidifying its ties with Latin America. By 1888, in Moro de Paz, uh, the editor is writing editorials where he's uh, criticizing the encroachment of the American government onto Cuba, right? He sees the Cuban-American War coming 10 years before it happened. Right, he's writing about it in his editorial, right? Um, and before I get too much into it, I just wanna let y'all know that, uh, and with El Moro de Paz, there's about two or three copies on microfilm in the, in the public library, but there's actually an original at the Latin American Library of Tulane. And that was one of my primary sources for my, uh, for my master's um, thesis, which is uh, called a Spanish element in the deep south. Um, and so then, uh, you know, I got the master's in 2009. Uh, I, I started my PhD program in 2016. And I'll just say that I'm using the, the Latin American and Latinos pro, uh, Latin American and Latino studies program at the at UCSC is, a uh, is, a uh, is dynamic. It's, it's multidisciplinary. And so I'm, I'm doing my best to use a multidisciplinary approach to explore New Orleans as, as a site of inquiry for Latin American and Latino studies. And for me, that, that means um, continuing my ongoing research in the past, right, of, uh, of, of newspapers and, and, and following, you know, those primary sources to see where they lead, right, so that I can, you know, better understand what New Orleans as a port city, how it was connected to the rest of Latin America, because that's really what those newspapers really tell us, is, is, is the commercial relationship and how New Orleans, even though it was a, a, a city in the United States, stayed connected to Latin America in a way that other cities just weren't. Um, uh, but I also um, want to explore the contemporary because of the work that I did as a community organizer. I'm very invested in contemporary issues, right? And so uh, because I have a, because it is a multidisciplinary program and that's the approach I'm using, I'm also figuring out how to, uh, how to um, you know, do an inquiry on contemporary issues and the contemporary community in order to, uh, to make the case that, that New Orleans is a rich site for, uh, for scholars such as myself and even Dr. Gallero and others who who are interested in the connections between New Orleans and, uh, and Latin America. And with that, I, I, I'll stop. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Rafa. So the floor, we are open for questions. Does anybody have any questions? You can put your hand up. If you have any questions, you can type them in the chat. Uh, I saw Hannah Palmer with a hand up. She was clapping. I was okay. clapping. Okay, cool, cool. <laughs> I'm sure she'll... I'll let the students start with the question. All right.
All right, Max, go ahead. Hello. So um, I was wondering about, so you talked a lot about how New Orleans in, has a lot of similarities um, with Latin America, with architecture and culture and things like that. I was wondering why you think this is because New Orleans, while it does have a, like, a big Latinx population, it's not the like, biggest but in terms of cities in the United States. So I was wondering why you think New Orleans has these similarities compared to other cities. That's a, yeah, thank you for the question, Max. Um, that's solely tied to the colonial history. Uh, so um, the French, the Spanish, and the Portuguese use very similar styles of conquest, right? So when they would start a city, they pretty much had an understanding that, you know, you, you were going to put the, the church in the middle of it, like St. Louis Cathedral, and build around it. And obviously the people with the most privilege and, and access would have the homes that were closest to the center of, of the town. Um, with New Orleans, it's right on the river, so it's geography. It's actually one of the simplest designs compared to cities like Santo Domingo and Havana, but it's, it's still pretty similar. Um, another thing that you have to understand is that there were two fires in New Orleans in the colonial era. The first one was, I believe, in, in the, seven, I, well, no, one was in 1788, and the second one was, I believe, in 1794. I believe they were both in the Spanish era. And so this, in totality, both fires, they were within six years of each other. They took out about two thirds of the city. I could be wrong about that, at least half, but, but probably more. And so a lot of the city uh, was rebuilt in the Spanish style uh, when it came to uh, colonial architecture. And, and the Spanish had a formula for it too. Um, you look at the Cabildo and the Presbytery in the French Quarter, for example, um, those buildings are three stories high. The mansard roof was, a, was, uh, was actually added in the 1850s. If you take off the mansard roof, you have buildings that are pretty similar to other Cabildos and other buildings uh, such as that serve the same function in other parts of Latin America, including Paraguay, Havana and Argentina. So it, it, it's solely tied to the, to the colonial history of the city. I saw James Morgan with a hand up, I think. Yes, sir. So I'm, I'm from Houston, Texas. There's a big uh, Latino community there. I'm just curious about New Orleans is, is very binary. If, just, if you're just walking around and seeing it, it's, it's typically black or, black or white people in the area. What do you think the impact is of the Latino community in New Orleans? Well, I mean, honestly, you know, up until 2005, I would have said, and I've actually seen, um, when I was doing my research in, in my master's degree, I, I did see some, uh, there's a few archives around town that talk about the Latino community. And I would have described what I saw in, in, in those small archives and what I heard uh, my, you know, my friends and, and families and, and, and uh, their friends say is that we were invisible. Right. Uh, that that is how I felt. Um, the the community wasn't really, you know, Hispanic heritage was wasn't, wasn't a thing when I was growing up. Um, we did have, you know, some festivals or some, you know, events that would bring people together. Um, but, you know, you really didn't see, um, you know, you didn't really see uh, uh, Latino communities as political factors. We weren't a discussion of the of the political um, uh Debates and uh, and I mean when you look at it, New Orleans I think by now is, is back to about four hundred thousand in population and Latinos are only about five percent. You know um, another thing too is that I think I should mention this to clear it up is that when when I talk me specifically but I think in general too uh, when we say you know the Latino community or the Latino communities in New Orleans we really are talking about a metropolitan community right we're not just talking about Orleans. A lot of folks have experiences like mine where we've lived in Orleans and in Jefferson, or we may have lived in Jefferson, but our work and our school was in Orleans. You know, I lived in Jefferson Parish for a great deal of my life, but I would say that I lived most of my life in Orleans, right, because I lived and worked there. And so, um, and so I just wanted to make sure I said that before I forgot about that, James. But, you know, yeah, this, this city is definitely a binary. Um, the population has grown dramatically since, since Hurricane Katrina. but. Um, you know, uh, still as a political force, I feel like we're still invisible. Or there's still a, a feeling of invisibility, but you know, that's also changed. I, ca I can't say that that hasn't changed. Um, obviously, the existence of nonprofit organizations is a big is a big part of that. Uh, but also, you've just seen um, I think Latino communities be more intent in participating in New Orleans culture. I think that's something that that I that I've seen since I've become an adult. Yeah, one thing that's interesting is when I moved here, I moved here in 2007, eight, and with the influx of the, the workers and, and um, 
the laborers post Katrina, that's what a lot of stuff was going. A lot of people were talking about it's the first time that it hasn't been a, like the conversation between black and white, which has always been the conversation in New Orleans or in the metro area. All of a sudden they had this out, well, not an outlier, but they had this other group to contend with. And they didn't know what to do with that other group, right? Like they had no idea. So in reality, that's a, the Latinx community is still, the Latino community is still kind of on the out. Like they're doing their own thing around still this black and white. And in Kenner, for example, Kenner is 16, 17% Latino. Yeah. So that's in Jefferson County. That's around the airport. That's 16, 17% Latino. Historically, it's been probably the most Latino of the metro area. Um, but it's just, just interesting that that you don't, hear much from them either still and they are a significant uh, uh um that's a significant population right mm -hmm. jimmy you want to go sure yeah i i my question really was uh connected to this idea of the invisibility of, of the Latinx community in, in New Orleans. And, and I'm wondering, I've always wondered if, if it has anything to do with class identity and this, uh, you know, this need for Latinx, the Latinx community to be perceived as assimilated into the white community. And mm -hmm. so, what that means is you don't assert a Latinx identity, you just assert a white identity mm -hmm. and <clears throat> any kind of political power or engagement is filtered through that identity because that's associated with white, upper class, professional class. Mm -hmm. And I think that changed after Hurricane Katrina, right? When the mm -hmm. perception was very different. But I'm just wondering if, if, if you've thought about that or if you have any you know, thing to share about that from your own personal experience and from your studies. Oh, absolutely. I think if it's related to class, it'd be actually the opposite. It'd be because, you know, a lot of times, um, you know, people of, of Latinx backgrounds are going to work a lot of the most menial jobs in the city, right? Uh, when it comes to, uh, uh, you know, uh, service industry, you're talking about, you know, the lowest paying jobs in the hotels and the restaurants. Um, a lot of times, you know, uh, and, and I would also say that, you know, we moved here in 1988, and I would say that, you know, considering that 1965 is really, you know, when we first, you know, when, when the influx really started coming after that, we're really only in our second or third generation of this community, right? And so, from what I've read, you know, it usually takes a generation or two before, you know, most people in a family are registered to vote, you know, or, you know, uh, participating in, 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 in politics like that. Um, I don't know if it's assimilation because uh, the kind of, uh, you know, the communities that have, that have come here um, generally aren't white. You know, we're talking about Central Americans and Caribbeans um, uh, that oftentimes don't have familial connections. Um, so I think the invisibility is, is one is that in Louisiana, you know, I've, now that I've lived in California and in Florida um, since leaving New Orleans, I can say that those states the presence, the, the density and, pre and presence of the Latino communities in those states make it so that they can't be ignored. And that's just something that's never, that we've never had in Louisiana. Um, I'll add to that, that, you know, migration into New Orleans from Latin America is historic, right? Throughout the 300 years. I know for myself, you know, growing up and, and, and having friends that, you know, that literally his families have been here sometimes for centuries. I've always heard stories from, from New Orleanians, black or white, saying, oh, well, you know, I've got an ancestor that came from Cuba, or some great, 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 great that came from Honduras, or some great, 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 great that was from Mexico. And depending on, on you know, honestly, what I've realized is that depending on, on this person, on the, my friend's race, you can see where they came from and how they got assimilated into the city. You know, uh, I, I have one friend actually who recently found out that they have an ancestor from the Dominican Republic who migrated to New Orleans in 1885. They have a picture of this woman. There was no way this woman was going to live anywhere outside of the black neighborhoods in New Orleans or integrate in, into, after seeing this picture, this woman was definitely a black woman in New Orleans. And, you know, from what we know of the social wars at the time, there was no way that she was going to integrate into any other community. Right. And so there's this really convoluted web of migration and really complicated histories when it comes to um, 
to, to the migration patterns into New Orleans from Latin America. Can I follow up just to ask Rafa your impressions of this? Because you know, many people who know the, the Latinx community in New Orleans oftentimes think of the Azucar Ball and the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. That, that's a different community, you know? I mean, yeah. but there's a connection, but there's also a, a very much of a distance there. Yeah, there's a very, and look, I, I've met some of the people at the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and they're fine people. I never met any of them until I started working for a nonprofit organization and became a professional myself, right? Uh, and that was through you. You were there for that, Jimmy, because that's when I was working at Puentes. So you know when those connections were made. And uh, I think the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, you know, does good things. I, but yeah, they're not representative of the community that I belong to uh, when I see it. The Azucar Ball, again, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, you, you know, you'd hear about it, but it's not, you know, yeah, they weren't representative. Now, if we're talking about, you know, the radio stations that we've had, you know, those, those are... You know, traditionally there was Radio Tropical and, I, and, and the other one I think was Radio Caliente, I forget. And those two have been around since the 60s and 70s. And, and they were, you know, when it came to media, they were some of the biggest staples in, in the community. And, and when we talk about different, just to clarify, because we, you know, we've been talking about kind of like Latinx identity. What are all the things that go into Latinx identity in our class just for the last four and a half, five weeks, right? Mm -hmm. I think we're going to we're going to start talking about like uh the the uh mexican mexican americans and the the treaty of guadalupe hidalgo just finally we're getting to history but talking about race and talking about um labels and so when they say different y'all they're talking about like read white yeah. and read a different class read professional classes right when we talk about the azucar ball and the hispanic chamber of commerce um just so yeah. uh so because we've been we talked a lot of we we been talking about race a good bit in uh in language as well um and sophie has a question and she put it in the chat rafa mm -hmm. how do you think this compares to the invisibility of asian american communities in nola i.e vietnamese population in new orleans east uh man i i i, I wouldn't um i don't want to compare them because uh i i mean i've got friends in that community and i've, I've got an understanding of their history uh i would say it's very different just because um that communities, you know, they migrated here in the 70s and that's a, that's a community that's got a lot of trauma associated with the Vietnam War and, and, and things of that nature. Um, so it's very different in that regard. I know one thing that, that has really um, been at the center of, of their development as a community is knowing that the reason they're out in New Orleans East is that they were placed there so that they could be far away from the rest of the city far away from its resources, and, and at least this is how they feel, but you look into how, you know, refugee communities are traditionally treated in the United States, it, it, it's, it's not out of the norm or out of the ordinary. And so there's this disconnect um, that the Vietnamese community seems to be really aware of, um, that they didn't create among themselves. Um, I think, and again, this is only my thought, if there's anything that has you know, with Vietnamese folks in particular that, that maybe has uh, worked to uh, help them, I don't, I, I don't want to misspeak here, but you know, let me say more clearly, uh, Vietnamese folks in, in the community in, in New Orleans East in particular, and really all over the metro area tend to be Catholic. And I think the presence and, and the power of the Catholic church has always been something that for uh, migrants from Latin America and from Vietnam has always been um, something that's seen as welcoming, right? Um, I wouldn't say that it's an ideal institution, but it does help, you know, I know, I can't count how many people in my community have gotten to New Orleans without being able to speak English, but those ES, ESL classes at, uh, at Catholic Charities really helped. My mother was one of them, right? Um, and I know that they have ESL classes for, for uh, Vietnamese folks too, but uh, I, would, I definitely wouldn't compare the two because they're just so different and they're born from, so, from such different traumas. Um, and, 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 uh, uh, and again, with New Orleans, I think the cultural traditions and the cultural norms are so similar to Latin Americans, to what we know of in, back home that um, the, the, you know, the process to, to, to making New Orleans home is just a little bit different for us than it is for other folks maybe and for other, and even in other parts of the country. Thank you. I worked with Bela this summer, so I was just really curious on how that really is, yeah. Very good people. Give me one second, I just gotta get my charger before this computer runs out. <laughs> Uh, just forget it. Okay, I'm back, y'all. Um, anybody else have another question? I've got one, but 
Oh yeah, Hannah, go. I've got a quick one. This is not as serious a question, but you say you're researching the connections between New Orleans and Latin America. So have you found any connection that is really surprising and has kind of made you change the way you think about New Orleans status in the world, in this Latin American world? Um, um, I don't know if there's any one thing that, that helps me. So I can answer that in different ways. Let me say this, is that uh, as far as New Orleans status in the world, my research has shown me that when you think of New Orleans, you, you have to think it is one of the centers of the Americas. And I mean that literally and figuratively. Like, it's literally in the center when you think about it. It's, it's at the bottom of North America, right across, you know, the ocean from, uh, from the rest of the Americas. But if you look at when New Orleans was founded 300 years ago, 1718, by the time that it was founded, the French, Spanish, everyone knew what they were doing as far as colonizers, right? And so 85 years after it's founded, it becomes, you know, it becomes a, a part of the United States. And honestly, to, you know, to put it, American history in a nutshell, you don't have manifest destiny without New Orleans coming in into the United States, right? And so it's literally at the center of the country. It's at the center of the Americas. And not just, you know, I don't want to think of, uh, you know, literally, you know, draw a circle and put New Orleans in the middle of it. But when you think of what makes Amer the Americas distinct from the rest of the world, um, it's really hard to pick a city that's, that embodies that more than New Orleans, as far as North America is concerned, I think. Um, another thing that I'll say is that uh, one of my, hopefully when I finish writing my dissertation, um, this will be involved in it. But one really cool fact about New Orleans that, that's connected to, um, to Latin America is that there's this really, really interesting history of exiles, of political exiles from Latin America coming to New Orleans. And I mean, literally for the last 200 years, right? It's not something new and it's not just a couple of people, but uh, we're talking about M Mexican uh, exiles, Cuban exiles, Dominican exiles, exiles from South America. The Cuban flag was, was first flown in New Orleans in 1851 because it was designed in the United States and first flown on Poydras. There's a plaque in front of the federal building, if you don't believe me, right, uh, to commemorate that. It just, it, 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 so um, Benito Juarez, the reason there's a statue of Benito Juarez on, 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 is it Rant, on Basin Street is because he spent like four years as an exile, maybe not four, more like two or three, as an exile, you know, uh, rolling up cigars and selling them around town at night, you know? But he was also, you know what he was also doing? He was also organizing weapons and sending them down to Mexico so that the revolution he was a part of could keep going, right? And he was not the only one. He was one, he was part of a network of Mexican exiles that, that apparently were here. And I'm gonna stop saying that before one of y'all steals my research ideas. Thank you, that's fascinating. Any other questions? Um, I, my question for you, Rafa, and this is more on the kind of the personal side of it about um, you know, we, we were reading about uh, Puerto Ricans in New York, right? And how because of the binary and the one drop rule that oftentimes, well, not oftentimes, and this happens, right? Like um, in Latin America, people tend to, they don't tend to define themselves by their race, right? It's by their culture, by their ethnicity and how in the United States they're excised from that, right? Like you are a black man when you were, when, when you, and you said your father was like being a black man in the South and you're like, wait a minute, I'm Dominican, right? So can you tell us, and I know that plays out differently here in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. How did that play out in New Orleans? And have you been allowed to be Afro-Dominican or Afro-Latinx? So that's Here, interesting. In New Orleans, in a way that you wouldn't be able to do it anywhere else, do you think? Well, oh God. Well, let me put it to you like this. And when I moved to Florida for the first time in my life, I had people walking up to me speaking Spanish, and that was a shock. Right? I had never had that happen to me before. But in, in Florida, I am read as, a, as an Afro Latino male, which is Latino, right? It's, it's, it was very easy for people to pick that out and just to walk up to me and start speaking Spanish. That never happened in New Orleans. Literally, and I've got friends that identify as Creole, right, who are, you would call passe blanche that, you know, look white, but, you know, identify as black because they do have black ancestry because of the history of New Orleans. You know, it is that way. And we've been to a Spanish or, 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 a, or a Mexican restaurant or some Latin American restaurant, and they'll get asked what they want to order in Spanish, and they'll talk to me in English. You know, so that's just, you know, that's actually some of the more fun ways in which that's played out. Other ways that that's played out is, is white friends finding out that I'm Dominican and treating me better. 
Well, they didn't become friends until they found out I was Dominican, right? Um, just um, when people found out that I wasn't African American, that I was in, you know, my family was immigrant, the attitudes always seemed to change and they were always for the better. Except, of course, with black people who generally didn't care because I was just a black person. Um, and even if I was from outside, you know, when they found out I was Dominican, you know, they, it didn't really seem to matter. Um, I think, so that's one way, right, is the, um, you know, it really taught me at an early age uh, that there's racism, there's bigotry, but there's this particular strand of anti-African American bigotry that's really um, volatile, toxic, and ready, and always ready. And, and um, it, made, it made my life very, very uncomfortable, but, you know, um, it, shaped, it shaped the lens in which I view the world. Um, uh, how else would it have played out? I think, um, to be honest with you, and this wasn't by design or even by choice, it's just, you know, I'm lucky that I've been able to have good friends, but I definitely got to go to a lot of spaces that a lot of my Latin American friends wouldn't have imagined being in. Not that they were against it, but it's just that, you know, um, you know, look, I'm going to be blunt about it. When you're black, you just know that people sometimes put up a front and they don't want to get to know you. And and um, and I think a lot, you know, and, and there's reasons for that. I, that doesn't mean necessarily that you're anti-black. I think that's a reflection of the world that we live in. And I think, you know, one of the healthiest things that that happened with my dad, you know, being very adamant of, of me understanding that I was black is that. Uh, you know, um, is that it didn't matter to me whether or not my friends were, were Latin or not, right? And it also um, made it easy, I guess, for, for Black people to befriend me, you know, to have genuine relationships with people who weren't Latin American, who weren't Latino, Latinx, Latina. Um, and, uh, and so I, I found myself being invited to spaces. And when I would tell, you know, friends of mine that, that, were, um, that were Latino, they, you know, they couldn't imagine ever being in those spaces. I, I don't think that makes them, you know, it doesn't really speak to any sort of uh, racial tension, but um, just the different things that you can experience when, you know, depending on, on, on how others view, view and read you. All right, any other questions? Hands, anything? Brief. We could go on forever, but, um, all right, I think we are done. Uh, Rafa, thank you so much for your time. So much uh, for sharing with us your personal experience, your academic work, it's very exciting. Thank you very much um, and best of luck to you. Thank you and so much. And I hope great. to see you again soon. Hello. Great. great to see you, Rafa. See you, Jimmy. All right, y'all, thanks so thank much. You. See y'all tomorrow. We can unpack some of this tomorrow.